us about how many of us have attended this conference in the past years. No quite a number of us raise up our hands. When he also asked whether we have been receiving testimonies, I wasn't looking back. But I'm sure not all of us raise up our hands. Maybe you are not sure that you have been receiving testimonies. I want to say something to you now that will make you praise God and thank Him. I want to tell you that you have been receiving testimonies. Amen. You see, if God should open our eyes to see certain things, some of us will never pray to ask for anything again. We will just be thanking God. I'll give you an example. What if God suddenly opens the eyes of somebody here? Because you agree with me that there are two types of open eyes. There is the naturally open eyes and there is the spiritually open eyes. Amen? Amen. Uh, second Kings chapter 6, you remember the story of Elisha when the army of Syria came to surround him, the chariots of the army of Syria, when the king asked that they should go and arrest him. And the servant of the prophet came to report that they have been surrounded by enemies. And the man of God, the prophet, laughed. I said, they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And the boy was wondering that. I said that the enemies have surrounded us. And the prophet prayed. I said, Lord, open his eyes. When God, was he blind? He was, at least physically, he wasn't blind. But spiritually, he was blind. And when God opened the eyes of that boy, that young man saw chariots of fire round about Elisha. So he just started dancing and rejoicing. And he started beating his chest. I said, if they burn you well, you come and touch us. We are, if they burn you well, you come and touch us. And he started saying that to the soldiers that came to arrest them. Why? Because now his eyes have been opened. And he now knows something that his enemies did not know. May God show you something that your enemies do not know. Amen. If God were to open my eyes, for instance, and show me that if I had not come here, to pray at prayer conference here yeah, last year. If God just opens my eyes to see that I would have been dead and not be alive to partake of this year. And God just shows me what could have happened to me if I had not prayed or if I had not come to the conference last year. What would I be doing? What would I start doing? Will I not start praising God? Or if God shows me that, but for the fact that I was present at the last prayer conference of this church, I would have been rendered paralytic, forgotten. Or something would have just happened. And people would have started saying sorry, 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 sorry to me. But God will say, but because you came last year, I'm preserved. So how many of you Agree with me that between last year and now you have testimonies. The fact that you are alive to be here, because not everybody that was alive last year, I'm not seeing from this church, from anywhere in the world, not, not everybody that was alive yesterday is alive today in the whole world, isn't it? So the fact that we are alive, we are still alive between last year and this year's conference. And we are able to stand here again. Let's go ahead and begin to give thanks to God. Let's thank God. Let's really appreciate God. It will be selfish to start making prayer requests again when we have a multitude of reasons to give thanks to God for prayer. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we appreciate you. Lord, we bless you. Lord, we glorify you. We thank you, Lord, for being with us all these past years. Lord, we are grateful to you. We thank you for strength. 
We thank you for sustaining us. We thank you for enablement. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your beauty. We thank you for your grace. If it had not been for your mercy, I would have been consumed. Your mercies are new every morning. Grace is your faithfulness, Lord. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for our pastor. We thank you for his beloved wife. We thank you, God, for all the wonderful children you have blessed them with. We thank you for your church. We thank you for this beautiful congregation. We thank you for every family. Lord, we are grateful that right now we are not sorry. Right now we are not biting our fingers. Right now people are not saying sorry to us. Lord, we are grateful. Lord, we thank you. We appreciate you. Even we are just sitting in the middle last year. You have made a way for us to be last year and now.
Great Britain. Because we are here for such a time as this. The Bible commands us to pray for the city, the nation, where God causes us to dwell or live in. For it is in the peace and the prosperity of that nation that you and I will have our peace and prosperity too. If you are not praying for this nation, then you don't know the purpose for which you are in this nation. You and I are not just in this nation to make pastor live and consume it for, to our own loss. If that is our goal, if that is our focus, then even that pastor live will be so far away from us. But the moment we understand that we are here for a kingdom purpose, that we are in this nation so that this nation will not perish, that we are in this nation so that ancient foundation can be restored, and when we begin to pray, and we begin to do church and do kingdom matter, knowing that that is God's plan and purpose. Whoever works according to the will of God can never be poor. Whoever moves according to divine purpose can never lack. Whoever is working according to the, to the plan and purpose of God can never die prematurely. We need to understand and get that. And I can tell everyone, particularly those that are not originally from this country, Everyone that is here in this nation at this time, you and I and many others, we are here for such a time as this. Mm. God deliberately catapulted us here. Not because of the initialism for which you came. Because God will always allow you to see a purpose reason why you should know. But behind everything that you see, there are things that you cannot see. Yes. That only God cannot see. That, that only God can see. Esther didn't know when she was contesting. She didn't know that the purpose why God will allow her out to win that election and become the queen was so that the Jews will be delivered from the wicked decree of Amar that was that, that, that had been promulgated. She didn't know. So there is always a purpose behind the purpose. And it's the purpose behind the purpose that is for God. I believe we are here in this nation so that we can bring the glory of God back to this nation. And this is the year of Jubilee for this nation. There's no better time to pray those kind of prayer than this year. This year of Jubilee. It's not just the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. It is Jubilee for the entire nation. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. All authorities are ordained by God. It is Jubilee for this nation. Amen. And brothers and sisters in Leviticus chapter 25, one of the things that God ordained will happen, must happen at Jubilee is restoration. And we need restoration in this country. So many things. What restoration? We need restoration of the Asian foundation, of righteousness, of godliness. This is a nation that sent the gospel to many parts of the world, including where you and many of us came from originally. We watched the, the video of the coronation of the queen 60 years ago. 100% of the ceremony and the service of the coronation was Bible. Was Bible. The what she took was Bible. She took an oath that I will govern the United Kingdom of Great Britain according to the commandments of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those were her own words. At the end of that coronation ceremony, they took Holy Communion. When they were giving her the crown, they said, This is the crown of righteousness that you are wearing. When they, no, they said, This is the crown of mercy. When they gave her the scepter, they said, This is the scepter of righteousness. When they gave her the robe, they said, This is the robe of holiness. Everything had to do with the gospel, with the Bible, she, she took her own. Look at where you and I came from. Look at the, way, the coronation of our kings and chiefs. How are they done? Were they done according to the Bible? They were done in idolatry manners. In fact, for some of them, they will kill human beings while they are doing the coronation. For some kings that they coronated in Africa where I came from, you will have the new king will have to eat a part of the heart of the dead king. That's why they use this land, old Jobba, he hates the king. You must eat a part of the old king. But that's a different foundation from what is there. So that's why the mercy of God allows you and I to be here for such a time. Because that foundation will be restored. Yeah. All those cathedrals that you are seeing, they are coming back to the church. Yeah. And we are occupying one of them. Yeah. This church yeah. is possessing one of them. Yeah. God has already settled it. Yeah. Are you ready to move? Yes. You are moving. Yeah. 
But God will not allow the wicked to take over those things that belong to righteousness. So we are going to pray now for great preaching. I have to lay that foundation because I want your prayer to, for this nation to be from beyond today. I want you to continue to pray for this nation, lifting up this nation in prayer unto God. That's why I said all that I've said. It's a prayer conference, it's a prayer meeting, and it's important to make some little, little points like that to encourage us to pray. But now we're going to pray for great Britain. We say, Father, Father in this year of Jubilee, in this year of Jubilee restore the foundation of righteousness, restore the foundation of righteousness in the United Kingdom of Great Britain. Father, in this year of Jubilee, restore the foundation of greatness in the city of Nottingham. In the name of Jesus. Let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. Restore your glory. Let your glory come back. That's what we are saying. No more in Cabo. The glory of God that has departed. Return to our nation. Return to Great Britain. Return to the city of Nottingham. All these cathedrals that you are looking at. All these massive towers. They were not built for goats. They were not built for dogs. They were not built for rats. They were not built for cars. They were built for human beings. Who will flow into them and worship God. And worship God. Those cathedrals are the foundation of righteousness. They tell us stories that this nation has served God. in that nation. I want us to pray for the nation of Nigeria. The enemy is at war over Nigeria. Not just to divide that nation, but to move that nation into a terrible war. And those of you who are Nigerians in only of origin, in origin here, yeah, we agree with me that that nation cannot afford to go into war. Whether tribal or religious war, we can't afford it. 140 million odd people. Where are you going to put them? The refugee crisis that will eat the world, God forbid. How will the world be able to contain them? We can't afford it. And God will not allow it. Amen. Certainly God will not allow a few cabal, enemies of the nation, to plunge an entire nation that has a great destiny in the hands of Jehovah into war. So we are going to pray. 
All God needs to do is to gather the enemies of Nigeria together and deal with them. Amen. How many of you will pray with me tonight? We will use Jeremiah 17, 18 to pray. Jeremiah 17, 18. He says, let them be confounded that persecute me. But let them not be confounded. But let not me be confounded. Let them be dismayed. But let not me be dismayed. Bring upon them the day of evil and destroy them with double destruction. Amen. We will lift up our voices and pray. We say, Father, Father gather the enemies of Nigeria together. Gather the enemies of Nigeria together. And destroy them. And destroy them. With double destruction. With double Let's pray in the name of Jesus. Yes, God, yes, God. Signs and wonders of 
visitation of healings and deliverance. Thank you for our garden again this year. Thank you for preserving us to see today. Father, accept our thanks and praises in the name of Jesus. He said upon this rock you will build your joy and that gate of hell will not prevail. My Father, my Lord, every gate of hell assigned against the church tonight, destroy them. In the name of Jesus. The foundation of righteousness. We restore back to Great Britain. We restore back to our city. We restore back to our family. We restore back to our lives. In the name of Jesus. My Father, my God, save Nigeria. Deliver her from our enemies. And destroy the unrepentant enemies of Nigeria. With double destruction. In the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask that as David prevailed over his Goliath, this weekend, let all your sons and your daughters honor the sound of my voice that have come for this conference, that have come for this conference, that are still going to come. Father, let each and everyone prevail over their Goliath. Prevail over your stubborn problem. Prevail over your giants. Receive complete victory. About this time tomorrow, let many begin to testify Amen. of the victory that you have already given them. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Tonight, Lord, give us utterance. Amen. Confirm every word spoken on this altar. Amen. With signs and wonders following. We vow that you and you alone will take that glory. Amen. For no man will share your glory with you. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Shout amen like thunder. Amen. Put your hands together for Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Shake hands with two or three people and tell them, my victory is certain. What about yours? What about yours? My own victory is certain tonight. Tonight, my victory is certain. What about your own? Tonight, my victory is certain. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Please be seated. I want to thank and appreciate our beloved pastor and his beloved wife for the opportunities given to me, even on a yearly basis for the past years now, to be part of the great work that God is doing in his church. I do not take that privilege for granted at all. So I want you to join me please to appreciate my beloved pastor, a pastor Mrs. Bikini for the Lord and affection that have towards me and for their hearts towards the work of God. Praise the name of the Lord. If you have a man of God that has been working in the Lord for more than a decade with no scandal, with no reproach, with no scandal in his ministry then you need to give that man of God double honor and double appreciation. Some started this place, even as recent as five years ago, they are no more. They backstabbed, they fallen fallen as men of God, as Satan will be fighting on a daily basis to bring a man of God down. But if a man of God has been standing for more than a decade, and is still standing strong, stand, still standing in red for Jesus, overcoming storms here and there, then you need no proof that God is with that man of God. Give our beloved pastor and his wife another round of applause unto Jesus. We are just one and his wife standing. We want to give thanks to Jesus. Give thanks to our Father for your son and your daughter. And we pray tonight that you continue to stand. You will not fall. You will not fail. You will not fall. Down. Appreciate him with prayers, always appreciate him with support for the world 
because the world needs your support, both practical and material support. And always appreciate your pastor materially too. They that labor in the world, the Bible says that they deserve even double honor. Amen. Amen. They deserve just reward. They deserve just reward. Do not fail to always appreciate the one that has spiritual authority over you. And as you do so, God will bless you all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. It's my great joy to be here. And I bring you greetings from my beloved wife, the most beautiful woman in the whole world. Praise God. And also your sister church in London, Victory House. They are praying for us too at this program. Amen. And my brother and Pia is also here with me, Ronari and Jerry. Tonight, as we kick off these three days that promise to be one of your best days ever. The topic tonight is going to be victory over the storms of life. Victory over the storms of life. As I was sitting in the inner room where prayer was going on, I was so delighted. The minister, of course, I appreciate all the ministers and pastors in the house and workers. May God bless you. I was delighted when I had the minister leading prayers, referring to our storms. I said, wow. Did this man see? If I slept here last night, I would think maybe he saw my nose. But because I came straight from London, I knew that he would only have seen it in the spirit. Hallelujah. So when he was speaking about victory over our storms and was leading prayers in that direction, I said, well, Holy Spirit, you are one. Where the Spirit of God is, there is liberty. And out of two or three witnesses, a thing shall be established. So I am glad tonight that even before I preach, even before I preach the message, the Almighty God had already gone ahead to give somebody here victory over their storms. Amen. If you are that one, shout another amen. amen. And our test is taken from Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14 from verse 22 to 33. Matthew 14, 22 to 33. Matthew 14, 22 to 33. Are we there? Yes. We can also look at it on the screen. We read from KJV. King James Version 22 to 33. Let's listen carefully, please. And straight away, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a sheep and to go before him onto the other side. But say other side. Other side. While he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straight away Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. Tell your neighbor, be of good cheer. Be, of good cheer. be not afraid. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him, and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore did thou doubt? And when they were coming to the sheep, the wind ceased. That wind around you will cease. Yeah. 
Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. This year, the world will see the hand of God in your life. They will say concerning you, Of a truth, God is with you. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Victory over the storms of life. A few years ago, maybe two, three years ago, at one of our yearly prayer conferences here, I preached on the topic, Power Over Contrary Winds. And I remember we used the story of Paul, the apostle, in Acts chapter 27 and 28, when he was traveling to Rome, and their ship encountered storms of great wind. The Bible says that they encountered that the wind became contrary to them. I remember that story. Now, this is different tonight. Even though you can compare the two stories together in the effect and in the attack that came against them. Yet, there are two different instances. Because here in this story, this was not Paul the Apostle. It was Jesus Christ our Lord that saw his disciples experiencing contrary wind. Even as his disciples began to travel in the boat that they were traveling in. And he came and he began to walk on the water towards the sheep where they were traveling. And the storm of the enemy came mightily against them. Tonight, we want to look at some of the things that we are talking about and define them. What is a storm? We are talking about victory over the storms of life. What is a storm? A storm is a disturbance of the normal condition of the atmosphere. A storm is defined by the dictionary as that which manifests itself by winds of unusual force or direction, often accompanied by rain, snow, hail, thunder, and lightning, or flying sand or dust. Storms can be damaging and destructive. Many air crashes have been caused by storms. Storms have claimed lives even in great number. Storms have caused tsunamis in nations of the world. Storms have caused hurricanes in nations of the world. And whenever these storms came, the consequences were mass destruction. Destruction of lives, properties, and possessions because of storms. Storms of life, therefore, can also be likened to some stubborn problems that we go through in life as human beings. Stubborn problems of life can be likened to storms in the way and manner of their operations. For instance, we define storms as that which disturbs the normal condition of life. You will agree with me that there are also some problems that disturb the normal conditions of life. For instance, a normal condition of life is that someone who is prepared to work and who has the necessary qualification should get a job and be working and earn income. That's a normal condition of life. But if suddenly such a person resumes work, maybe on a Monday or Tuesday or Friday morning, only to be told suddenly by the employer that your services are no longer needed. You will agree with me that that singular incident would disturb the usual condition of life. The normal condition of life of getting a job to do, going to work and coming back and giving thanks to God, 
being suddenly informed that your services are no longer required. It's like a storm that comes upon a person. Storms can be unexpected. And so are some problems of life. They can come unexpectedly. They can come when you least prepare yourself for such problems. Like the example that I just gave. A person resuming work, not having done anything wrong, only to be told that there is no more work to do. And we live in the days of storms that are disturbing the normal conditions of life. We live in troubled times. I just wrote a book titled, Winning Keys in Troubled Times. And I thank God that within a few weeks of publishing the book, it has blessed diverse testimonies. To the glory of God, I did, I just, I did a weekend program at Jesus House in London, was there for their three services on Sunday and also uh, on Friday and uh, on Saturday evening. And the pastor, pastor who was sharing a testimony before I started preaching, and he said, regarding this book, and I'm not saying that to, to, to publicize the book or anything, but just to tell you that we are living in troubled times, and there are keys, there are ways to win over the troubled times. And may you have beat over your troubled times. Yeah. He said that the, uh, the relation of one of the victims of, uh, of the recent plane crash in Nigeria, because a few people known to many of us died at the inside that plane crash. That may be the mother of one of the victims of somebody. That the brother to one of those victims, as a result of the tragedy, was going into depression. He just couldn't handle it. And another relation got hold of a copy of that book and gave to this man. And the man read the book and was instantly here. Yeah. That you may even in troubled times. There can be cause to rejoice. I pray for everyone going troubled times. May God give you victory in Jesus. Amen. So troubled times are times of storms in life. And we live in such times. Times of economic downturn. Times of joblessness. Times of harassment from authorities here and there. Times of credit crunch here and there. Times of marital conflicts and crises. Times of having to raise children and you have challenges and crises. Raising those children. Raising positive children under negative environment. is in itself a storm that parents are confronting in these challenging times. And so there are diverse storms that we are going through in life. There are storms in relation to our health and well-being. Everything is okay for somebody only to be suddenly diagnosed with a sickness or a disease. With no, with, 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 with no money whatsoever. I went to visit a brother a couple of days ago. Out somewhere outside London. He was working, had a fantastic, beautiful contract with BT as a computer scientist. Everything going well for him. Beautiful house, wonderful, beautiful family. Just got married. And one month after his marriage, he just started feeling feverish. Normal flu condition. And he began to cough. He used cough, uh, cough mixture and the cough will not go after two or three days. So he decided to go and see his GP. The GP decided to run some tests and they said they would get back to him. And that afternoon, he still where he went to work. He was coming back from work. Nothing amiss. Nothing stopping from going to work. And he just got to the train station to take a train to come home in the afternoon. And the GP rang him. And the GP said, wherever you are now, proceed to accident and emergency. What happened? What happened? He said, because your result, the result of the test will run on you. Just came. Beloved, that same evening, he ran to the A and E as he was instructed. Of course, he did not leave that place. He was there for the next three days. They were running tests. By the third day, they told him that his kidney had failed. That he had suffered kidney failure. He started what they call dialysis. And for the next one year, he was on dialysis. Storms of life. 
he wasn't bedridden for some days. He wasn't in any major, major physical crisis or affliction. Storms can come suddenly, as you know. The atmosphere, the weather can be bright, everything okay. And suddenly, the hurricane or storm can come. That is how it is with some problems of life. They are not prepared for, and they just show up suddenly. But two days ago, when I went to see this brother, he had overcome the storm. Hallelujah. And his entire system had been restored. Amen. Only one month after he got married, and a wonderful wedding that he had for that matter, and the storm started. And the storm raged against him for one year. Many will have, many have died as a result of storms like that. But the Lord delivered him. I pray for somebody tonight. The deliverer will deliver you from every storm. Amen. I said the Lord will deliver you from every Amen. storm. Every violent storm of affliction that is attacking and raging around you now, my God will silence them all. Amen. If some people have survived the storms of life that came against them, you will not be an exception in the name of Jesus. Amen. You too will survive that storm. Amen. Lift up your right hand. I will survive this storm. In the name of Jesus. So as the disciples began to travel to the other side, the Bible says the wind became contrary, and storms came, and it began to threaten their ship. Their ship was going to capsize. It was a raging wind. They were confused. They didn't know what to do. And so the story happened that all of a sudden in the middle of the night, Jesus Christ who sent them ahead to go to the other side and went to the mountain to pray. He began to come towards them at the time that they were experiencing storm. He showed up and of course he rescued them from the storms. What lessons do we learn from this story that we have read in Matthew 14, 22 to 33? What lessons do we learn about the storms of life and how to overcome them? We want to share a few lessons tonight and then we will pray. The first lesson that we learn from the story of the storms or the contrary way that came against the disciples as they were traveling from, traveling from the other side. Listen carefully, beloved. Let's go back to some scriptures or verses of that story. In Matthew chapter 14, 22, Matthew 14, 22, the Bible says straight away, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a sheep and to go before him onto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. The thing that we want to talk about there briefly is their destination. Everybody say, I have a destination. Everybody say, I have a destiny. I have a destiny. And my destiny, and my destiny. Has, a destination. has a destination. By the special grace of God, I will, I will reach that destination. Listen to me, beloved. Our Lord Jesus Christ told the disciples, He said, Get into the sheep and begin to go to the other side. Go ahead of me on to the other side. The lesson from there very quickly, brothers and sisters, is that there is always the other side of life. You have not reached where God destined you for yet. No matter what you are going to right now, there is a purpose there. There is a plan there. And the purpose of God is to get you to the other side. No matter the storms raging around you now, there is a purpose there. There is a plan there. The purpose and the plan of God is for you to get to the other side. Amen. The Bible says, and we know this, that all things work together for good. Romans 8, 28. For they that love God and are called according to his purpose. It was Jesus that told them, begin to go onto the other side. If, if it was Jesus that told them to go to the other side, even if storms came as a result of their journey to where God has sent them to, he will see them through. Amen. May I submit to you tonight that if it is the Lord that brought you here tonight, and it wouldn't have been the devil, the devil wouldn't have told you go to a prayer meeting. The devil does not know how to pray. He can pray. He can preach. He can quote scripture. He can do everything. But the only thing he cannot do is that he cannot pray because
because he has no one to pray to. And he can't pray in the name of Jesus anyway. Nobody is waiting there to answer his prayer. So he could not have been the one that sent you here tonight. It must be God. And if it is God that sent you here tonight, he will see you through. Yeah. Alright, so there is always the other side of life. Why? Because for every coin in your hand, there are two sides to that coin. Do I have a witness to that? Yes, this coin in my hand has two sides to it. In the same manner, life has two sides unto it. In Genesis 8.22, Genesis 8.22, the Bible tells us that Jesus a glimpse of what life stands, looks like. He says that while the earth remains, while this life continues, as long as there is life, there is seed time and harvest time. There is cold and heat. There is summer and winter. There is day and night. And that these things shall not cease. Meaning that there will always be two sides to everything in life. Praise the name of the Lord. There is the other side to poverty. The other side to poverty is prosperity. Hallelujah. There is the other side to sickness. The other side to sickness is health, divine health. There is the other side to failure. The other side to failure is success. There is the other side of barrenness. The other side of barrenness is fruitfulness. May I say to somebody tonight, you are going to the other side. Yeah. You didn't hear me. You are going to the other side. Yeah. So hear me well tonight, irrespective of the side that you may be tonight, that is not palatable, that is not comfortable, that is not conducive, that is not convenient. I have good news for you. That side will not last. Yeah. There is the other side. Yeah. And the other good news is that the Almighty God, whom I serve, whom you serve, is interested in taking you to the other side. That was why he came and told the disciples, get into the ship and begin to go to the other side. Every unpleasant experience that you are going through now has the other side. Hallelujah. The people that Jesus told to go to the other side, they were not strangers. They were his disciples. Hallelujah. As many as are born again, as many as are genuine Christians, as many as are called according to his name, as many as love God, you are called to be disciples of Jesus Christ. And he cannot be interested in any other one more than yourself. He can't be interested in any other one more than yourself. That is why everyone that is a disciple of Jesus here, yeah, everyone that is genuinely born again, everyone that loves God here, yeah, everyone that loves Christ here, yeah, everyone that is a follower of Christ here, yeah, you are destined for the other side. Amen. Say it, I'm destined for the other side. I'm destined for the other side. Beat your chest as if you mean it, I'm destined for the other side. May I say to you that the other side is a good side. Amen. The other side is a lovely side. Amen. The other side is a Canaan side. Amen. There is another side to Egypt. It is Canaan. Hallelujah. Amen. There is another side to hell. It is heaven. May you make heaven. Amen. May I make heaven. Amen. You are destined for the other side. Therefore, it follows. Whatever price you and I need to pay to get to the other side, it is worth it. Tap your neighbor say it is worth paying for us to get to the other side. The second lesson that we learn from this story in that same Matthew chapter 14, when you look at the next verse, verse 23. Matthew 14, verse 23. The Bible says, when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was alone. When he had sent who away? When he had sent who away? Isn't it interesting that Jesus Christ sent the multitudes away and then he called the disciples and told them, get into the ship 
and begin to get to the other side. Now we also learn great lessons from that as well. The lesson we learn from that is that it's not everybody that can get to the other side with you. Certainly, if you want to get to the other side, your association is bound to change. If you want to experience victory, because victory lies at the other side, power lies at the other side, breakthrough that you desire and deserve lies waiting for you at the other side. If you want to get there, you have to put some people in way in your life. And those are those that are called multitudes. Multitudes, multitudes, multitudes. multitudes. What are the examples of multitudes that you must put away if you want to reach the other side? Because they can't be in the boat with you. They can't be in the ship with you to get to the other side. Multitudes that you must put away are people with no vision of where they are going. They are people with no purpose. They are people who are mediocre. They are people who are discouragers. Multitude that you must put away are complainers and murmurers. Multitude that you must put away if you want to get to the other side are those who will tell you that you know this thing is not possible that you are looking for. You know, even the color of your skin alone will not allow you to get the job. Those are the multitudes you must put away. You know, everybody else that will try to apply for this thing, they never got it. You better don't try. Those are the multitudes that you must put away. Because you must be able to tell yourself that even if no one else got it, I will bring the record. I will be number one. Amen. There are multitudes that you must put away. I'm sure when they offered Gatwick, Gatwick Airport for sale, some multitudes would have told somebody that you can't get it. The powers that be will never allow you to get it. But I want to thank God, I'm sure that man must have said that I am different. Today, Gatwick Airport is owned by Nigeria. And Glasgow. Praise God. By black. With your God that is saying, go to the other side, all things are possible. And so there are voices of multitudes that you must put in. And why must you be careful about multitude? Is because, mommy, multitudes are usually in the majority. That's the price. That's why Jesus Christ had to put the multitudes away. Those who will say cannot be done are always in the majority. And if you want tangible achievement in life, you must be careful of multitude. You must be careful. When we were just about a hundred in our congregation, and we saw a property, and at that time, the place where we were worshiping, worshiping we just take maybe about 120, and we were just 100. And we saw a property that could take 600 people. When I shared the vision with the church, majority of church members said, Pastor, we can't afford that thing. We can't go there. We cannot afford it. Majority. Majority said, Pastor, we can't do it. We want to live in a place where we are paying only 1,000 pounds a month to a place where we will be paying 5,000 pounds a month, Pastor. And our congregation has not changed. <laughs> Pastor, we can't afford it. We can't. The multitudes were telling me we can't afford it. But I knew scripture. I knew God was saying, be ready, go to the other side. Go to the other. You have dwelt upon this mountain, Lord. Lord. I'm ready for the other side. Hallelujah. Until you take that step and begin the journey, the multitudes will tie you down, and you won't be able to get to the other side. I ignored the multitude, and I said, "We are going all the same. We are going all the same. We are going all the same. We are going." We moved. And when the multitude said that they couldn't tie us down, when we move, the multitude moved with us. <laughs> I pray that the multitude will see the glory of God in your life. Yeah. The multitudes are usually mockers who will tell you that what is wrong with you. Nobody has done this thing that you are asking for. Why are you asking for it? But may the Lord silence your mockers. Yeah. 
Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 2, 2 Kings chapter 2, when Elisha said to Elijah, wherever you go, I will follow you. Elijah said, I'm going to Jordan. So wait here. Elijah said, I will follow you. Elijah said, I'm going to Bethel. Elijah said, I will follow you. Elijah, Elijah said, I'm going to Jericho. Son, stand here. Elijah said, as the Lord liveth, as your soul liveth, wherever you go, I will follow you. All those times, there were 50 other servant sons of the prophet. Like Eli Elijah. What were they doing? They waited and were mocking Elijah. They said, don't you know that your master, come on God, don't you know that your master will be taken away from you this day? Elijah said, shut up your mouth. I have heard. I have let me be. In fact, they were telling him that this man that you are following about, this man that you are, he will soon die, he will soon be taken away. How much time does he have there? Elisha did not listen to them. And at the end of the day, who reached the other side amongst them? Elisha. Elisha reached the other side. Of all of them, he left them at Jordan, and he was the one that crossed Jordan. In the name of Jesus, may you lead the multitude. May you cross over your Jordan. I pray that you cross over your Jordan. That problem that men are called impossible, you will overcome it. That denial that everybody else is running away from God will give you victory. I said, My God will give you victory. Over your denial, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Dr. Right and say, Every voice of the multitude is standing against my destiny. I silence you now. In the name of Jesus. Every voice of the multitude. That will not let me go. I fulfill my destiny. Every voice of the mountain that is saying it is impossible. I silence you forever. Pray that prayer in the name of Jesus. in Nottingham, you will do it and succeed. Yeah. If no one else had knocked at that door in the city of Nottingham, you will knock at it and that door will open. Yeah. If no one else had gotten that kind of job in this city, you will get it in the name. Yeah. There is nothing wrong in being the first. Okay. But it's better to be the first. The first is called the record breaker. Guinness Book of Records were not created for second for second fiddles. The Guinness Book of Re World Record was not created for number two. They were created for number one. Why can't it be you? In the name of Jesus, the destiny can help you to the top. You can make a difference. You can make a difference. Irrespective of your background, irrespective of your circumstance. Please, let's be seated. The top lesson that we learn from this story of victory over our storms. Matthew 14, 24. Matthew 14, 24. The Bible says, But that she was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. I was a but. It was the Lord that told them to proceed on a journey to the other side. But the she was now in the midst of the sea, Tossed to and fro with waves, for the wind was contrary. Lord, I am doing your will, but why is this problem coming my way? Lord, I have you clearly that I should do what I'm doing, but why am I going through what I'm going through? Lord, I am paying my tithes, but why are my finances like this? Lord, I am praying, but why does it appear as if God is not there? Tonight, every but to your breakthrough shall be removed. Amen. But there is an important lesson also there. And that is the fact that contrary wind will always come irrespective of how righteous you may be before God. 
contrary wind of life is no respecter of persons. I am only Lord, I live only, I do what you ask me to do. But why am I going through what I'm going through? You will go through what you are going through. Because God did not promise a smooth ride to the other side. God did not promise a trouble-free ride to your breakthrough. Psalm 34 verse 17, Psalm 34 verse 19, the combined effect of those scriptures says, Many are the troubles of a righteous man, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. This woman cried unto the Lord. The Lord had him and delivered him out of them all. Psalm 34, I didn't say 35. 34. The righteous cried, and the Lord hear it and delivered them out of all. Out of how many? All. Who is that person that cried? The righteous. the righteous can face troubles. The righteous can face problems. So if you are going through storms of life, it's not necessarily because of your sin that you are going through storms. And you may be holy, everything may be okay, yet storms may come against you. If the storms did not attack the disciples, who should it attack? Should it just be the multitude who had no goal? The devil knew that your freedom to possess Canaan had come. That is why he will add in the art of failure to try and hinder you from breakthrough as much as possible. Contrary winds are not made for non-entities. They are made for champions. How many champions do I have in the house? Champions are not found where there is no battle. Champions are found where there is battle. You cannot see a heavy weight pitch against a light weight. A heavy weight in boxing will be made to confront another heavy weight, isn't it? The challenger that challenges a heavy weight, he himself must be able to be a heavy weight. They won't put a heavy weight to go and face a feather weight. He will kill him. So if you are heavy weight in God's agenda, that is why sometimes the storms around you will be heavy weight. But glory be to God, it is written. We are more than the conquerors. True Christ than us. Amen. Amen. Contrary winds do come against champions. So my brother, my sister, you may be here tonight. <coughs> you are going through certain things, storms of life. And you have searched yourself inside that, Lord, is it my sin? Lord, what have I done to deserve this? May I encourage you. You might not have done anything sinful, anything wrong. Yes, because of who you are in Christ. Yes, because of God's great plan and purpose for you. God may allow you to go through that contrary way. But the good news is that he that permits the contrary way to come your way has a purpose and a plan that is bigger than the contrary way. Amen. And by the time you come out of that contrary way, even you yourself will thank God for your contrary way. So you will suddenly be realize that if that contrary wind had not come, your breakthrough will not have arrived. May you see me next year and say, Pastor, I thank God for the storms that I went through last year. Because God has seen me through. And where I am now, if I had not gone through the storm, I will not be there. If you are still wondering what is this man talking about, Read Daniel chapter 3. In Daniel chapter 3, we have the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were not sinful people. They vowed not to defy themselves with the king's meat, and they did not defy themselves. They were holy and righteous. They were much more prayerful than you and I. But then, contrary with them, 
storms came and they said if they will not worship the god of Nebuchadnezzar, they will throw them in the fiery furnace and this young man said yes oh king our god whom we serve is well able to deliver us from your hands and even if it does not deliver us we still will not bow to your king we are ready for the consequences and the bible says that they put more fire to the fiery furnace he tell it even seven times more and they threw these three evil boys into the fiery furnace and when they got into the fiery furnace the lord opened the eyes of king Nebuchadnezzar, and king Nebuchadnezzar saw a fourth man there and he screamed he said did we not throw three men into the wind no i see a fourth man whose appearance looks like that of the son of god we have not yet read about jesus in the new testament he has not been born but because jesus christ the same yesterday today and forevermore because he is god he's already in heaven as the son of god and god opened the eyes of an unbeliever a heathen king to see the son of god right there in the fire with these three evil boys god said it when you go to the fire I will be with you and the fire will come to you. When you go to the waters, I will be with you and the water will not drown you. God did not say you will not go through fire. He didn't say if you go through fire. He didn't say if you go through what he when. So it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. But the good news is that whenever that when comes, he will be with you. He will be with you. He said, I will be with you until the end of the time. I will neither leave you nor forsake you. Is there someone here who felt left alone by God? Is there someone here who felt forsaken? You have come to this conference to be encouraged. Amen. You have come to this prayer meeting to be encouraged. Amen. That my God will not leave you. He will not forsake you. Amen. That that contrary wind has a purpose. That even in the storm that you are going through, God's plan, God's purpose will be made manifest. Amen. And you will be able to say that if not for the storms, your breakthrough will not have gone. And in concluding the story of the Hebrew children, if you read their story to the very end, after the Lord delivered them from the fiery forest, if you read Daniel chapter 3 in verse number 30, the very end, the very last verse of Daniel chapter 3, you will read there, the Bible says, and the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three boys were promoted by the king. Then the king promoted these three boys in these three men in the province of Babylon. Beloved, a contrary storm can be the examination of the true believer, of the true child of God. And you agree with me that a child, a student cannot move to the next level of his story of his studies without a test without an examination thank god therefore for the contrary wind because it is an examination and because you are not alone because the master jesus is with you you will pass that examination you will pass that examination and as you pass that examination this month and the next year the result will be a promotion the result will be a promotion Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have remained at the same level that they were in Daniel chapter 2. If contrary wind had not come, if the storm had not come, may I therefore announce to somebody that your storm, your contrary wind, is your preparation for the next level. Yeah. It takes us back to the scripture that says they were going to the other side. The other side is the place of promotion. Amen. Multitudes are not found there. Whenever you are promoted, you are lifted above your people. They said the Lord is my glory, my shade, and the lifter up of my head. In fact, the word promotion means to be lifted up. And the Bible says to us in Psalm number 75 that promotion does not come from the south, the west, nor the east, but promotion comes from the Lord, who put that one and set up another. May I announce to you that your storm, your contrary wind, is a set up. Amen. Now to three people say God is setting me up for promotion. Whenever you may be looking at me now as someone who is bedeviled, who is ready, ready with so many problems, so many crises and so many storms. But may I announce to you, God is setting me up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. I 
myself praise for. Hallelujah. Maybe I've shared the testimonies with some of you here before. If you had it before, hear it again. If you are hearing it for the first time, hear it and don't forget it. It illustrates the points that I've been making. A young man was working as a clerk in a bank. And then he had a supervisor in the bank. And this young man was a believer, a child of God born again. And this supervisor hated him with a passion. Hated him because of his faith. Because this supervisor was, was an idolatry person who belonged to one of the occultic secret society. So he hated this child of God and was doing everything to bring him down. And any time this child of God is working in the bank, this supervisor will look at him and say, even when you are working, you are working as if you are the one that won't be back. <laughs> and this child of God did not help matters. He will reply him and say, Oh God, my God holds all things, including the bank. He's my father. And so if my father holds all things, including the bank, I must well work as if I'm the one that holds the bank. And that will make the man mad. It will make him angrier, even the more. So he began to plot his downfall. And he began to tell lies against him to the management. Eventually, he orchestrated, he brought stop against him, and management began to believe this supervisor. So, eventually, management transferred this boy, this young man, as a clerk. He transferred him from that particular branch and took him to another branch. The seller just transferred him, let him go there. So, they, they killed him there, and the boy was there. About six months later, the manager of the branch where they transferred him to, maybe he was moved to another branch or was promoted. So there was vacancy for the office of the manager there. And so this is the supervisor of this boy who was in another branch. Now began to talk to management and say, I've been a supervisor for more than 10 years now. I'm due for promotion at least to become a branch manager. I've had, sir, now that there is a vacancy at social branch, please transfer me there to be a branch manager. So management now called the meeting and they called the man. They said, ah, is that not the branch where we transfer the man that you had quarrel with, that clerk? Is that not the branch where we transfer him to? He said, yes, sir, it's the branch. But please send me there. Let me go and meet the manager there. And where he's still a clerk there, where you dream him to? Send me there. Ah. So management said, okay, we will decide. So management met and met and met. But there is a God in Israel that this young man was serving. Even as he was going through his storms, with all the lies that made management to transfer him to that place. And management finally came up with their decision. And they called this supervisor and other members of staff of that branch. They called them to a meeting and said, Well, since we have been told that there is this young man who works as if he's the one that holds the bank, that we transfer to that other branch. Now that he's in the other branch, what we will do is that we will test him. Let him ask the active branch manager for the next three months. If he doesn't perform well, we will remove him. But let him do act as acting branch manager. Mr. Supervisor, you will still remain supervisor here. But we will test that boy that you claim works around as if he holds the bank. So they made the young man branch acting branch manager. At the end of three months, the kind of income that never came to that branch for the past 10 years, it came more than triple came. The performance of that branch outshined the performance of the branch where they removed that young man from. And the management men that said, well, with this kind of performance, we have no choice. Even though it's like this ordinary plan, we'll be jumping about six steps. We have no choice with this kind of performance. There is something that is working for this man. Let us make him permanent branch manager. So the good news for you and I is this. Whenever the men at conferences of supervisors of managers, this clerk that they hated so much will sit as branch manager. His supervisor is living in him, he will sit as his junior. What became of the story? The storm catapulted this boy to his promotion. I pray for somebody here tonight. May your storm take you to your glory. Lift up your eyes, say, Father. This month, turn my storm to my glory. In the name of Jesus, pray that prayer now. Fox 
important lesson to learn from this story. Is somebody being blessed tonight? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. There's a fourth significant biblical truth to learn from this story. Matthew 14, 23, the story that we are learning tonight. Matthew 14, 23. We were told in that scripture that when Jesus had sent the multitudes away, he himself did what? He went up into a mountain apart to pray. I was saying, went up to a mountain. He went up into a mountain. To pray. To pray. Now, this was immediately I found after he sent his disciples and said, begin your journey, go to the other side. Jesus went to the mountain to pray. Beloved, if you want to overcome the storms of life, don't wait for the storm to come before you start praying. Start praying before the storms come. Many of us, it is fire brigade prayer we pray. Many of us, we only pray when there is trouble, when there is crisis. Many of us, we only fast when Wahala comes, when trouble comes. But beloved, true Christians, true believers, we pray whether there is a problem or not. They will fast whether there is a problem or not. They will prepare themselves for the day of trouble. They will prepare themselves for the day of storm. My brother, do you agree with me that Jesus Christ knows all things, including the things that have not happened? You agree? That he knows tomorrow. Okay. My brother, do you also agree, sir, that even before that storm came, Jesus Christ must have known that as these my disciples are going to the other side, there will be a storm. He must have known, sir. And because of that understanding, he went to pray. What is the purpose of prayer? One of the things that prayer does is to prepare us against the day of adversity. One of the things that prayer does is to scotch the plan of the devil. Hallelujah. One of the things that prayer does is to ensure that all the plan of the wicked, they do not come to pass. One of the things that prayer does is to ensure that the evil that the enemy meant for us, that the almighty God is able to reverse it. Hallelujah. When a man, the other guy, got the king to sign a decree, the children of Israel, and that decree would be to terminate and kill all the Jews on the twelfth month. Well, before the twelfth month came, Esther had gathered the Jews together and they had begun to pray and to fast. The moment you know in life that it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, then like Jesus Christ, you will know that storms will come. Storms will come. So you prepare yourself ahead of time to deal with that storm. And your best form of spiritual preparation is in the place of prayer. Beloved, I say to you tonight that it is mountain dwellers and mountain climbers that overcome the storms of life. Amen. Jesus Christ went on top of the mountain to pray. And who are mountain dwellers? They are prayer warriors. They are people who pray. You don't wait until your child faces an examination before you begin to intercede for the success of your child in the examination. Many of us in the church, particularly as a pastor today, we are dealing with issues and matters that could have been prevented. If only husband and wife had given their lives to Christ long ago, if only husband and wife had dedicated the prayer family altar, where they met regularly and gathered their children to pray, many of the things we are now battling today, we will be battling them. Hallelujah. Amen. Many of the problems we are having with children, even in the church today, nine out of ten of those children, when you speak to their parents, their parents only ran to church to give their lives after things started getting out of hand. Many of those little children did not grow up at family orders. Many of them don't have fathers, don't have the kind of fathers who will wake up in the morning and wake the entire family let us go and pray. It is when problems have now come that people are running to God. Those who want to overcome the storms of life must pray not only when the storms have come but they must pray even when in advance of the storms. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I said praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. May our prayers even at this moment 
may they be sufficient to deal with every storm that the enemy is planning for our tomorrow Amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. That is why the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 18 verse 1, our Lord Jesus Christ, Luke chapter 18 verse 1 when he told the parable of the widow and he said, men of all ways to do what? Pray. To pray and not to think. And in 1 Thessalonians 5 17, 1 Thessalonians 5 17, that is where our Lord also told us, that's what true Apostle Paul, that pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Because there is a purpose for prayer. There is a purpose for prayer. Pray when there is no problem. Pray when problem comes. Pray until you see solution to the problem. And pray after solution to the problem. Prayers are never wasted. Revelation chapter 8 tells us that prayer has a goal in heaven where they are being stored. Prayers don't die. Prayers are forever alive. Prayers are never wasted. Prayers don't have burial ground. They are never buried. Prayers are forever alive. Because the person that is receiving the prayers from us is forever alive. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. I said glory be to God. Hallelujah. What number are we now? Four. Number five. I've just finished four. Five. The fifth lesson that we learn is that Matthew 14, 24 to 25. Matthew 14, 24 to 25. The Bible says that the sheep was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. Amen? Amen. And in the fourth watch of the night, what happened? Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. I have good news. They are also and a great lesson. When storms come against a believer, and I think I've said this in the course of sharing some of the testimonies and some of the scriptures. When you are in the midst of storms, beloved, open your eyes very wide because Jesus is not far away. Amen? Amen. And if Jesus is not far away, it means hell is not far away. When a child of God is going through storms, Power for victory over the storm. We come at the hour of yesterday. Jesus is not found. Talk to people and tell them Jesus is not found. Jesus is not found. Jesus is not found. Jesus is not found. David said that he is my present head in time of need. He's not found. Everybody else may be far away. I say this to encourage somebody else. Your husband may be far away. In the hour of your need or storm. Wife may be far away in the hour of need or storm. Friends may be far away in the hour of need or storm. They might even have deserted you and disappointed you. All those that you expected to help you may be far away in the hour and in the season of your need. But may I say to you, Jesus is not far away. Amen. The invisible God, whose works are visible, is not far away. Amen. Very soon and very soon, all those who have despised you, all those who have deserted you, they will see the hand of God. Amen. Amen. He said, when my mother and my, when my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up in his hands. Jesus is not far away. Where it stands, begin to rage around us. Another lesson that we learn from this story, Matthew chapter 14, verse 27. Matthew 14, 27. The Bible says, When Jesus Christ showed up walking on the sea and they were afraid, he said, Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. Tap your neighbor again and say, Be of good cheer. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. 
Listen to me carefully. We're talking about some great lessons on strategies for overcoming or for gaining victory over our storms. The storm was still raging against them, isn't it? The storm was still there. It was not still yet. Their ship was being tossed up and down. And Jesus Christ showed up and he told them, Be of good cheer. Can I begin to tell us the meaning of good be of good cheer? Be of good cheer means rejoice. Be of good cheer means celebrate. Be of good cheer means shout hallelujah. Be of good cheer means begin to smile and laugh. Now there is storm raging around them. And Jesus said, Be of good cheer. The lesson there is that as a true child of God, in the midst of the troubles and problems and crises that you are going through, learn to rejoice. Learn to do what? Rejoice. Learn to do what? Rejoice. Can you give us Abacob chapter 3? Abacob, the book of Abacob chapter 3, verse 17. Abacob 3 from verse 17. Shall we read together 17 to 19? One to go. Although the fifth tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vine. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the feet shall give no meat. The flood shall be cut off from before, and there shall be no high in the soil. Yes, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and He will make my feet like my feet. And it will make me to walk upon my high places. To the chief singer who was singing and playing keyboard, this man was rejoicing. Even though the fig tree will not blossom, even though the herbs, the sheep, the goats in the in the, in the, in the, in the of the flock have been killed and destroyed. Even though the olive will not produce crops that year, there was economic depression, there was drought, there was famine, there was credit crunch, joblessness and rejection. That man said in verse 18, Yet I will praise them. I will rejoice. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Maybe what? In the midst of my storms, I will be of good cheer. Those who want victory over their storms must learn to sing praises to God. Not after the storm alone, but even while the storm was still raging. One of the greatest, most powerful weapons of victory, one of the strongest keys to breakthrough and victory in life is when you are thanking God, when physically speaking around you, there is no reason to give thanks to God. No wonder the Bible says in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. That's the story of the woman that we all know in 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 18. 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 18. The story of Anna. Anna was bitter. Anna was going through storms of childlessness. But Anna went to Shiloh and prayed. And the Bible says concerning Anna that after prayer, she went away and did it. And her countenance was no more. Many what? She was of good cheer and began to rejoice. Has she become pregnant? Has she had a child yet? No! The condition, the circumstance was still the same. The storm was still raging. Penina was still waiting at home to penalize her and to mock her. Yet she began to sing praises. She began to rejoice. She began to rejoice. That was the key to her victory. That was the key to her breakthrough. Because the following year, the dancing she danced by faith, the rejoicing she rejoiced by faith in that shino at that temple, the following year it will become a reality. I pray for somebody here going through crisis and troubles. The hallelujah that you will shout here tonight. The rejoicing you will rejoice here tonight. About this time next year, you will be standing here to testify. If you are the one behind you, the loudest hallelujah. If you are the one now, make a joyful noise on
thank you, sir. Please be seated. No wonder Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3 tells us that with joy will you draw water from the wells of salvation. Amen. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Amen. Inside the wells of salvation, there is water of righteousness. Inside the wells of salvation, there is water of breakthrough. Inside the well of salvation, there is water of deliverance. Inside the wells of salvation, there is water of promotion. Inside the wells of salvation, there is water of total healing. Inside the wells of salvation, there is water of prosperity. And the Bible tells us that with joy, with thanksgiving, with praises unto the Lord, you will draw water. Amen. You will draw blessings Amen. out of the wells of salvation. Shedding tears and crying as a child of God in the midst of your problem does not take you to God. That's not to say that we must not shed tears. God created and made tears. That's not saying that we must not cry and wonder at times. But we must quickly get out of it and get back to God. When they took everything from David in 1 Samuel chapter 30 and he cried from morning to evening, did this cry bring it back? No! But when he went to inquire from the Lord, the Lord said, Pursue, overtake, for he will show you God. He gathered himself together. And he began to pursue. Peter staying in the boat does not take away his time. He asked Jesus, he said, If today you are Jesus, ask me to come. And Jesus continued, Come, come, come. And he stood up and he stepped on the water. He too began to walk on the water. Beloved, the lesson that we also learned is seven points, and I will stop at that. Because of time. Even in your storms, learn to take steps of faith. Amen. Even in your storm. Pray in your storm. Pray down in your storm. But even back up your prayer with faith. Take steps that begin to take you out of that storm. Don't remain in the storm. Take positive steps. Knock at doors that the enemy does not want you to knock. Keep applying for the doors. Keep knocking at the doors. Keep making yourself better. Sitting down and complaining, no job, no job, ready to complain. May I tell you one news that even in the midst of this economic depression, millionaires are being made. All over the places. What are we doing? That you as a child of God. Not do better and do righteously for that matter, and then go back to God. You don't sit down there and keep on mourning. I don't have this, I don't have this. Things are tight, things are tight, things are tight. Beloved, when you are saying to people, things are tight, things are tight, other people will agree with you and they will say, with you, Yes, it's true, things are tight. But those who are saying that with you, they are breaking through. You better learn to change your confession. Praise God. Amen. Tap your neighbor, say, In your storm. In your storm. Change your confession. Change your confession. Peter said, If today you are Jesus, ask me to come and also walk on water. Meaning that in the midst of your storm, God is still ready to do the impossible. God is still ready to make the impossible to become possible. Amen. Storms give God an opportunity to showcase his glory. Give God an opportunity to show himself as God. When they asked Jesus, why was this man born blind? Was he him or his parents that sinned in John chapter 9? Jesus Christ said, he did not sin, his parents did not sin for him to be born blind. He was born blind so that the glory of the Lord might be made manifest. If you are a true child of God, another reason why you should rejoice in the midst of your storm is that it is giving God an opportunity to show this himself as we go. The storm of honor gave God an opportunity to showcase himself as a God of miracle. The storm of Lazarus gave God an opportunity to showcase himself as the resurrection and the life. The storms of Peter who toiled all night and caught nothing gave God an 
an opportunity to showcase himself as the one who can give the 24 hour miracle and turn failure to overnight success. What storms are you going through? What storms are you surrounded with? Is it not, not an opportunity to make God to be who he is so that the world around you will see and know that only God can do this? And then they will come and they will come. They will come. That's the point. The altar. I join my faith with yours on this altar tonight. Lord, I pray every storm that may be raging around your sons and your daughters because they have come into this Mount Zion. The Bible says, Upon Mount Zion, there shall be deliverance and goodness. And the house of Jacob shall possess their possession. Father, because they have come tonight, I pray that you will arise and deliver them from every storm. In the name of Jesus. When you enter the storm kept quiet. Therefore, tonight, I invite you into the ship of destiny of every man, every woman under the sound of my voice. And as you enter into the ship of our destiny tonight, let the storms, the raging storm, let them be silenced forever in the name of Jesus. When storms come against a child of God, it is a setup for divine promotion. Therefore, I pray that the promotion that is embedded in the storms and the troubles around your children, that promotion will not be delayed. Yeah. It will not be delayed any further. It will not be delayed any further. Yeah. I command your promotion to appear. Yeah. As that storm disappears, let your promotion appear. Yeah. As that storm disappears this year, let your breakthrough appear. Yeah. As that storm disappears this year, let your victory appear. Yeah.